Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's Marine Money webinar, New US Sanctions Advisory on Shipping, What Ship Owners, Lenders, and Charterers Need to Know Now. I'm your host, John Chair, and today I'm excited to have Jonathan Epstein from Holland and Knight with us to take us through this extremely timely and complex issue. I know now, I know that many of you know Jonathan, but for those that don't, Jonathan is someone who has spent over 20 years representing clients on regulatory matters before various government agencies. Jonathan works closely with Holland and Knight's maritime practitioners and advises a number of marine industry members on sanction compliance issues. He has written and spoken extensively on how sanctions affect the maritime industry, of which we will link a couple in our follow-up email. And before becoming a lawyer, he served as a Navy engineer and deck officer and also worked as a regulatory specialist for the Coast Guard. So in short, there are a few people in the world better to speak about this issue than Jonathan, and we are happy to have him on this show. Now, before I hand over the controls to Jonathan, a couple of ground rules before for those who are new to our webinars. You will be on mute during this webinar to ensure quality control of the audio, but during this webinar, you have a control panel that should pop up on your screen. Should look something similar to the one that I'm showing you now. Um, there are kind of two primary actions that you can take today. The first is to ask a question. This is, a, this is essential in helping understand this complex topic. So don't feel uh, you know, shy as there are truly no dumb questions. And these questions are anonymous. So even if they are dumb, I will be the one that bears that probably. To ask questions, simply enter your question into the text box at the bottom of the control panel where it says questions. I will receive them. And at the end of the webinar, I will ask them on your behalf. The second major action is the ability to collapse that menu and so that you can see Jonathan's uh, presentation in all its glory. Um, you can do that by clicking on that white arrow that's on that orange box. So that is really all that I have to say. I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to Jonathan Epstein um, so that you can take it away, Jonathan. Great. Thank you, uh, John. I really appreciate it. Are you seeing the right screen? I see a go to webinar screen right now. Uh, if you click on the PowerPoint, you should be good to go. Okay, hold on one second, people. I will get this going. Uh, and if Jonathan kind of gets this PowerPoint up and running, I think that we just a quick note to the audience. You know, we really appreciate you guys tuning in. Um, we feel like for us at Marine Money, this is definitely the best vehicle for getting timely information to you guys. So. With that being said, I'm actually going to leave it, let Jonathan kind of take you off on that. Yeah, you, you have the screen up now? Absolutely, Jonathan, you're ready to go. Okay, well, thank you everyone, and uh, I hope everyone's uh, safe and well. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm presenting from uh, my house in, uh, in outside, outside of Washington, D.C., and, and hopefully won't be interrupted by cats or teenagers. Um, we've got a lot to cover. I'm going to try and unpack this sanctions advisory for you over the next uh, 25 minutes or so, um, and uh, give you my impressions uh, as somebody that's worked in this industry. Uh, you know, really, I'm not going to go into the details. It's a 35-page document. Uh, many of you have read it. Um, uh, but what I do want to do is sort of focus on a couple of things. First is what I think this means. You know, where did this come from? What's the background? Uh, it didn't come out of thin air. Um, what are the implications in terms of what I see as accelerating self-policing within the industry and, and potentially even adoption of new technologies to address these? Um, and, and sort of how can companies in, in the maritime space, uh, shipping space, uh, implement these uh, recommendations? And, and I just I have this disclaimer um, that the we know this, uh, sanctions advisory was in the works for a long time, and there were meetings uh, between industry, certain industry groups, and uh, and the U.S. government, uh, OFAC, and the State Department. Uh, you know, I was not in the room, uh, so I don't have that sort of you know super insight. I'm not sure anyone has the full insight other than the government officials, but uh, I just wanted to make that disclaimer. Uh, key elements of the advisory and. I see sort of three key, it's sort of divided into three sections. And the third is the most important, I think. The first is sort of identifying deceptive shipping practices. 
we've seen some of this previously from um, OFAC, uh, you know, dis disabling manipulation of AIS, ship-to-ship uh, -ship transfers, falsifying cargo documents, but, and they do go into more detail here. But the, the, the last one, uh, and, and there are some others, but one is complex ownership structures for vessels, which they see as a red flag. I, I you know, there's, it's so common to have complex structures for other reasons that, that that's gonna be a hard one. It does provide a summary of the key, um, you know, primary and secondary sanctions that the US has on uh, Iran, North Korea, and Syria. Uh, primary sanctions being those that apply where there's a U.S. nexus, such as uh, a U.S. party, a U.S. goods, or, you know, banking, uh, you know, processing transactions through the U.S. banking system. Secondary sanctions being those that would apply to any, per, you know, non-U.S. entities, regardless of nexus, uh, because of the nature of the transaction. But the most important is the third section, which goes into uh, and there's some good and bad in this, but in a very granular detail into what compliance measures uh, the U.S. government uh, expects to see from the industry, and and they don't couch it that way. They don't, they, you know, they say these are recommendations. Um, there's some caveats, but these are very detailed guidance that that we are going to serve as a blueprint and best practices. It, it also expands to new to new people that were not, or two types of industry actors that weren't previously mentioned in, in previous guidance, including vessel captains, crewing companies, and commodities traders and brokers. Uh, uh, where did this come from? Uh, you put this in a little bit of context, the, the, the current administration, US administration has a policy of maximum pressure on Iran and North Korea. And, uh, you know, interesting footnote, it could spend some time on is why Venezuela wasn't included in the discussions here, because there's certainly a lot of uh, U.S. government tracking of vessels carrying oil from Venezuela and 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 even uh, gasoline and other products going into Venezuela. Uh, so that's a sort of interesting question. But the, the main thing I see is this is builds on the success the U.S. government had with the uh, quote unquote collaboration with US financial institutions. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, in the last five, seven years, the US government has essentially deputized uh, the financial, you know, the banks to enforce and, uh, you know, vet um, US, US sanction, first US sanctions. And I think that, that, that this, they see this as another way. They, they certainly identified the, the shipping industry as an area of, of high concern. Um, there have been a number of closed door meetings with uh, ship registries, insurers, and others. Um, and we know, uh, and in fact, this specifically mentioned, the advisory specifically mentions the sharing compacts between uh, Panama, the Panama registry, uh, Marshall Islands registry, and Liberian registry, and sort of encourages other, other ship registries to join. To, to share information on, on sanctions. Uh, the advisory builds, it, for, you know, th there have been since 2018, five prior advisories. Um, and one of the interesting things about this advisory, and, and I think it's a good thing, is that the, the prior advisories had lists of vessels that they considered uh, that they, the U.S. government suspected of having engaged in suspicious trading with Syria or Iran, North Korea. In many cases, those vessels were never sanctioned. They were just put on this would have sort of name and shame list, which uh, having represented companies um, both on that list and companies that were trying to figure out whether to deal with those lists, it creates this legal limbo for those vessels. Um, the fact that there isn't a list is a good thing. There is still some risk that I'll talk about of this sort of creating this legal limbo. Um, some other actions that have been going on is, is we do know that the US government has been passing sort of intelligence, e even though they might not be publishing a list, they are passing on names to insurers, to ship registries, to, fo to foreign governments of vessels that they think are engaged in sanctionable activity. Um, 
similarly, in the last uh, year or two, I've seen more, uh, if you're a US company and the US government wants information from you, they'll send you an administrative, OFAC may send you an administrative subpoena, but we're starting to see these requests for information that are sort of voluntary, uh, that are going to non-US entities with respect to transactions uh, often arising out of, you know, clearly out of bank reporting, but you know, you know, you were you were involved in this transaction. Tell us, give us all the information you have about those. And those are those are uh, are difficult to respond to. The the advisory does indicate there will be more information, additional guidance forthcoming, and, and I'm hoping um, that this will address what what I see as a real due dil uh, due process flaw in the current policy, which is that. Um, and I was in the military and I, I know something about intelligence and, you know, I also know about due process. And, and one of the problems is that, you know, the U.S. government has some information, they pass that on, or there's some suspicion a vessel gets, you know, on sort of a, 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 a black, an unpublished blacklist and there's no official due process to get off that list. There's no way to officially clear yourself. Um, and I'm hoping that one of the things the U.S. government does in further guidance, I mean, because there are methods to do that, to, to sort of uh, come forward. But if the U.S. government hasn't imposed sanctions, there's nothing to license. There's no, um, th there's no process, as there would be if a vessel was actually designated a, an SDN, especially designated national, or otherwise, um, you know, an entity pays a civil penalty which in some ways is much better than, than being on sort of some unknown blacklist where, where there's no way off. Um, for, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the enforcement environment. It's very clear that the US government is enforcing certainly strict, um, in some cases, strictly li strict liability on, uh, on US actors. And, and this was a case that from last year, although the, the actual incident occurred in, in 2019, where a, a, a charter broker, uh, you know, chartered uh, vessels that, that it turned out were owned by ERISL. Um, and one of the um, interesting things, and I'm not going to read these, is the, the big emphasis on compliance programs. And, and the U.S. government in 2019 has done a lot, not just this advisory, but domestically, um, the OFAC put out a framework for uh, compliance commitments that, that goes into great detail on what U.S. companies should be doing for sanctions compliance. Uh, the, the Department of Justice put out compliance guidelines for companies. So, so th there is a big focus. Um, so to keep things moving, the I'm going to talk a little bit about what I see as the, the positive and the negatives of this advisory. I mean, one of the positives, I think, is that for the responsible actors out there, the financial institutions, the owners, the insurers who, who have robust compliance programs and who don't want to have their vessels engage in some, you know, who, who, who want to be able to track this, this gives them leverage, the ammunition to go and say to the charters and the other parties out there, you need to have robust compliance programs. And you need to be giving us this information, and you need to be giving us additional um, reps and warranties. Uh, in a way, it may, um, in in um, in the anti-money laundering world, uh, the U.S. government had this customer due diligence rulemaking, which, in some ways, was a leveling up. It was look, banks in the U.S., the financial institutions in the U.S. had all sorts of different levels of due diligence, and so it sort of set a floor for what what expectations would be. Um, I, I, detailed, the detailed guidance is good. I mean, it, it, it's bad in, it, in that no, no set of checklists is gonna be perfect for every actor. Um, and I do think, in having been involved in, in dozens of uh, enforcement actions over the years from OFAC and state, that it does, it, it, you know, maybe not a true safe harbor, but I mean, the, the first question when, you know, the, the, the most important thing for a company is, you know, did you have compliance programs or, and how are you going to fix them? I mean, the, you know, that, that when, you're, when you're going to the U.S. government, you know, having found a violation or being accused of a violation. So it does provide 
some safe harbor uh, of some sort, having those programs in place, in addition to the mitigating the risk in a great deal. Um, the negative implications of this, uh, you know, obviously there is enormous cost, you know, many non-US companies in the shipping industry, maritime industry, don't have the sort of robust compliance programs that US companies have. And I can tell you from other industries, uh, particularly in the aviation industry, where there's an attempt to flow down uh, compliance requirements, that there's friction, there's, there's pushback and there's friction. And particularly in what I see as a transition period over the next few years, that's likely going to be the case. Um, I, I also worry about de-risking, right? You're going to have aggressive self-enforcement as, um, you know, company, we, we saw this in the Far East in particular with Russia sanctions where, um, you know, there were companies subject to very limited uh, sectoral sanctions and certain uh, Asian financial institutions said, well, we're just not going to deal with those institutions at all, um, even though they were perfectly legal, even for U.S. persons uh, to, to engage in. So I, I see that as a, as a risk, as well as the sort of disputes that are going to arise. I mean, certainly, um, you know, I, I was on the phone yesterday with one of my maritime partners on, a, on a, uh, the sanctions implications of, of, of a dispute where one party said, we don't like this transaction, we're backing out. Um, uh, unless you provide us certain assurances, which they couldn't provide, the other party couldn't provide, and so that's you know th that that is another issue. Um, as I said, th you'll probably see more vessels on these sort of unpublished blacklists without a clear due process remedy. Um, and then the last is the conflicts of law issue, which the, the the advisory touches on in the most indirect way. But but certainly you know here I am in lockdown in. You know, haven't been in the office since March 11th, been working from home. And one of the files I kept was my EU blocking statute file because that comes up all the time in contract negotiations. Is you know how do you and, and will come up in drafting you know compliance procedures if you're subject to EU blocking to, to the EU regs. How do you how do you address and and mitigate your your obligations under EU law with those under U.S. sanctions? Um, the issue of implementation, and, and this is this is key, I think, uh, and, and and certainly uh, I suspect that many financial institutions and um, insure, marine insurers are, are ahead of the game here. Um, is how do you address, you know, a fairly extensive requirements in a in a reasonable and practical way? And and one of the things is that. Is that you know for years OFAC? If you ask them, you know how much diligence is enough, or, or what should we be doing, you would get very vague guidance. Um, but they always did say it's based on risk, and and I think any any compliance program should be based on on a risk analysis. And so um, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get through all of these, but I just wanted to, to touch on some of the issues as they play out. They may play out. The first is this concept of a risk assessment. It's in the it's in the compliance, uh, the sanctions advisory. It's certainly something banks are familiar with, which is to say, you know, you call it a baseline audit if you want, uh, doing a risk assessment of your own company, right? What are my, you know, where are the geographic areas? Do I operate? Do I operate in the Gulf? You know, do I operate off the coast of Venezuela? Um, what are the products? I mean, there's a big difference between, you know, somebody that's trading agri agricultural commodities um, and somebody that's in the pet, that's a commodities trader that's, that's trading petrochemicals in the Middle East. So the first is to sort of identify the external risks. Then you look at your internal controls as they exist today. Are they, are they adequate? And there's going to be a delta. There's no way to, to mitigate all risk. You, you can come up with internal controls that, that will uh, help mitigate that risk. But there may be some areas that are, um, uh, you, you know, that you that people say, well, okay, that's too risky. I, I'm not going to have my, um, you know, my coastal um, uh, my coastal tanker trading in the Caribbean, uh, uh, or I'm only going to I'm going to limit its trade to certain areas because the, the risk is too high, or I'm going to have special, you know, build special fences around any SDS transfers because uh, ship to ship transfers because that's just such a high risk for me. And, and I would note that in the, in the 
in the bank, in the financial institution that will do risk assessments of their individual customers as well, including this sort of risk scoring. And, and we're just starting now to see sort of risk scoring enter main, you know, outside of financial institutions where, where, you know, they may look at a customer and say, or a counterparty and actually come up with a score to determine, you know, either how much diligence they're going to do or whether they're even going to do business with that person. Um, there's a lot written on developing compliance programs. I'm, I'm not going to go in too much into this one. There is this on the web, this framework for OFAC compliance that came out in 2019 that goes through the, the, all the various elements of a compliance program. And this is repeated in the sanctions advisory. Uh, I think the hardest thing is going to be developing the due diligence, uh, the sort of due diligence steps that, that uh, the, the advisory is, is expecting. Um, and I see that you, know, you, you may have companies with uh, that have to develop different protocols for different types of transactions. Um, the, the advisory talks about you know, reviewing vessel history for AIS manipulation um, before you, you know, charter such vessel. Um, you know, the one, the one takeaway I would say when you're developing these programs is, and this, I know fact senior enforcement officials said this at a conference once and it stuck with me for years is, is she said, if you don't have contemporaneous written, written records that you did due diligence, you didn't do any due diligence. And, and I can't tell you the number of times we've run across people who say, well, yeah, we, we did X, but they just don't have that written record. And that's just so important. Um, ongoing monitoring, uh, you know, the, the, this is a big part of the advisory. And I think something that uh, people should focus on. Um, there's an expectation that 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 you know certain industry players should be monitoring for AIS uh, signal disruption or or deviations from routes. I, I think there are products out there that can um, uh, help you with that. You know, that can automatically report that, and and also that can give you sort of geofencing if 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 a vessel goes into a certain area. I, I will say, having dealt with this issue, it does generate a lot of of sort of false hits. That you then, um, you know, what, what is the, the you know, is the, does the vessel transit the Straits of Hormuz, and is that going to trigger some uh, geofencing hit that you then have to figure out? So, so it does create a a, um, a compliance tasking level, um, and then you know, monitoring of your um, counterparties. Uh, contract provisions. Interestingly, um, you know, OFAC doesn't historically, in, in an enforcement case, they expect to see that there were sanctions clauses, but they also um, don't give much credit for that. And, and in fact, you know, there, there, there's a case out there, you know, where the fact that there were sanctions, you know, the, the, it, two things, the, the, the sanctions clause, however robust, doesn't replace due diligence and doesn't replace the obligation that OFAC thinks companies have to have some sort of ongoing monitoring of their counterparties in the transaction. Um, I, I put up here some of the clauses that were specifically recommended, uh, as well as some that we're going to start to see, uh, including one that's that's shown up in the Caribbean uh, with U.S. Uh, oil majors uh, about Venezuela trading. Um, I think one of the hardest things. I think one of the clear directions from the advisory is is that people should be clients need to be pushing down, uh, you know, owners charters need to be pushing down compliance on their uh, counterparties and you know, requiring that whether that's a contract clause that says, you know, representations that you that you have a uh, adequate compliance measures. Um, this is another one that I think is going to be really hard. I, I face this in other industries where you know. We, as part of the due diligence, ask for copies of the of our of our lessees' compliance programs, and the types of compliance programs you see in some non-U.S. entities, they either don't have anything, or, or it's it's completely inadequate. And and what do you do once you have that information? And, and I mean, one of the things that you can do is provide you know provide this advisory, obviously, but you can also provide training. 
um, with, with caveats and even assist them with developing their own programs. You know, for example, I have one client that sort of rolled out some model programs that they can use, uh, that, that their clients in certain industries can use uh, as a baseline. Um, I'm going to stop there. I, my last slide was on, you know, delegation, and the answer is no. You can't really delegate. Um, I do see um, one of the things, and I mentioned it in the very beginning, is there's an opportunity here for new technologies and, and auxiliary services, uh, you know, such as these monitoring services, rolling out new or, or products to help people monitor owners and, and banks and charter, you know, monitor where their vessels are. But I also see, you know, one of the hardest things is, is, you know, you know is knowing what, you know, is, is tracking the goods and the shipping documents. And, and here's something I think where blockchain shipping documentation, maybe there may be a real boon. And, and I don't want to say more because I'm really not an expert on blockchain. Um, but uh, uh, at this point, I'm, I'm going to end and open it up for questions. All right. Thank you, Jonathan. So we have a couple of questions that have come in. So audience, feel free to shoot some more in. Um, but the first one is, how does sanctions interface with OFAC? Are there any tools slash practices out there to help identify infractions before they occur so we may na navigate this proactively? Well, yes. I mean, the, you know, the answer, and then this comes up in, in, in um, you know, difficult times. I and mean, one of the things I've done at certain times is if you've identified an issue, um, you know, where you think there may be a, a, a violation and you, you've sort of done your best to avoid it, um, getting in front of OFAC and the State Department ahead of time and saying, we see this has happened, whether it's a, whether you're putting in a voluntary disclosure or in the non you know, primary sanctions area, you know, Sort of going to set, going to OFAC and saying we're 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 reporting this, you know, uh, and that is a, a huge. Um, I mean, doesn't doesn't insulate you a hundred percent, but you know, if you think about the goal, the goal of the U.S. government, the goal is not to to, to sanction some individual ship operator. It's to it's to shut down the ability of Iran and North Korea and and to a lesser extent Syria and, and Venezuela from from accessing these markets and you know, uh, um, uh, circumventing sanctions. So if you're gonna be up front and be a partner with them, uh, you get a lot of points. Uh, the, the downside of that is, you know, uh, and I've had this with non-US clients in particular, is once you engage with the US government, you know, you gotta, it's gotta be an open book. You gotta be transparent and expect questions and expect to provide information. Okay, that's fantastic. Um, another question is, as an equity investor, what do I need to worry about here? Well, so as, it, as an equity investor, there, there are sort of, you know, the, sort of the several things to unpack, right? As an equity investor, you're worried. One is if you're a, more than a majority investor and you're a U.S. person, then you may uh, make your foreign entity a, a person subject to U.S. jurisdiction for purposes of, of Iran and Cuba regulations. We saw recently with this, that, you know, there's this uh, Colombian airline, Avianca, that for, for odd reasons suddenly became owned by uh, a U.S. investors, and, and all of a sudden its operations to Cuba were, were a violation. So that there's sort of that level, and then there's the what can you do and depending on where you where you are in the investment but other is protecting your investment right and and i remember four or five years ago and i thought this was odd at the time and now it's not so odd is it a, a very large ec private equity company investing in a small greek ship owning company and uh, and uh, so it was an uh, and it was a major investment and one of the conditions was is that the the Greek ship owning company had to make representations that they had adequate compliance programs, and then it said, you know, see Annex A, and Annex A was five pages long, detailing what the what the investment company wanted to see in terms of compliance. Um, and I certainly have seen that from others, where they've sort of dictated, you know, with a fair level of specificity what 
what the expectations are. And, and now we have, you know, really fairly granular guidelines to help with that. Okay, great. We actually have quite a few questions um, being uh, submitted in right now. So I'm going to ask maybe we keep these these answers as you know, short and sweet as possible. Uh, okay. Jonathan, I know that it's somewhat, <laughs> can be somewhat difficult, but um, can you please address liabilities and responsibilities of commodity traders and commodity brokers with regards to US sanction? <clears throat> yeah, I think there is potentially, well, I mean, sort of, it, it, it's very fact specific as is everything in sanctions, but, but if you're trading in US dollars and even if there's no other US nexus uh, and the goods end up in the wrong place, you, you could potentially be liable um, for, um, you know, strictly liable for uh, for civil penalties or other action. But but I think the, the, the harder issue is the sort of the reputational risk where you have, um, and, and they sort of address this, is, is, is you have you're selling oil and there's a you think it's going to one customer and then they, they they sell it while it's on the water and it ends up somewhere else and that's where i think there's a real risk that that the u.s government investigates you or just to some extent and i hate to i don't mean to sound flip but there's this in some cases the u.s has imposed sanctions in sort of a a ready fire aim mode this is that they they have some information they're gonna you know you know you know tag everyone and then let the dust settle and people can come forward and tell them that well we know we you know we really didn't know so I, I think there is real risk for commodities traders okay this is a super specific question so um maybe i'm not sure how you want to you know manage this one but is it possible to remove vessels from the ofac annex to the advisory on petroleum shipments to syria or will it be possible in the new version of this advisory list can, can you read that again is it possible to remove vessels, remove vessels from yeah. the OFAC annex to the advisory on petroleum shipments to Syria, or will it be possible in the newer version of the advisory list? So, right, the, the advisory mentions that there's going to be further guidance on this point, and and what I'm, you know, my understanding is informally that in in some cases, you know, whether they're going to actually remove vessels from the advisory or maybe publish what what has been going on behind the scenes in some cases which is the vessel owner comes forward and says you know with the facts sort of makes a disclosure to, to OFAC says this is this is what we did these are all the measures we're taking and then gets you know some sort of comfort from the government or some you know and so I'm, I'm hopeful that that there will be a, a remedy and that was one of my points about the due the due process flaw in in the way the current system works great i know that we're running over time now so if people need to drop off that's great but i want to kind of honor some of these questions that have come in so what are the practical implications of a ship being on an unofficial blacklist but not officially sanctioned uh well <clears throat> the the ship registry may drop them uh and in which case you have a vessel that is uninsured and you know, uh, or maybe uninsured, uh, to the extent that information is shared, you know, take take the those the, those published lists. In some cases, those vessels were dropped from ship registries. In some cases, they were dropped from insurers. Um, traders trading with them may uh, question whether they they should trade with them, uh, and and so it it can be devastating to. To be on that unofficial list, um, and, and again, there, there's not a clear way to get off the list. Um, as you know, I'm not saying that that being designated an SDN is is better, but in in some ways, um, you know, you, you take like the PV tankers case in 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 the Caribbean. You know, they they got off the list, right? They and it's happened plenty of times, and, and certainly I've been involved in cases where vessels were, were seized and sold at judicial auction, things like that. There was a, a mechanism so that the vessel could be cleared. Uh, and that's what we need. Okay. Um, this is a bit of a wordy one, so bear with me. In the beginning of your presentation, you stated that you were surprised that Venezuela wasn't mentioned in the guidance. This was also a surprise for me. And furthermore, 
what is the OFAC's position on shipping, chartering, or bunkering with regards to other jurisdictions that hold substantial sanctions risks? In other words, should we treat other jurisdictions that hold a high sanction risk in the same way that we treat Iran, North Korea, and Syria? Yes, I think the answer is yes. I, I would say that, you know, that Russia is a little more, com obviously it's a little more complex because the sanctions are much more nuanced. Um, and there's plenty of trading that can lawfully take place. Um, uh, Venezuela is is probably the most difficult because, um, I, I mean, one of the things, you know, I was in the Navy, right? There's the Navy, the right way, wrong way, anyway. Navy was very clear about how you do things. It's black letter, right? This is pretty good in that it, it's very black letter. Venezuela is very difficult because the U.S. government um, isn't always clear as to what they what the sanctions are as they as they apply to non-U.S. entities. Um, and so I would be very careful. You know, there there was a recently a Reuters article about you know gasoline imports into Venezuela that was talking about how the U.S. government was reaching out to traders saying, we're going to say, you know, don't don't trade gasoline. You can trade diesel, but not gasoline to to uh, Venezuela, to PDVSA. Uh, you know, there, there's no public view of what is and isn't sanctionable. And, and, and so to me, those gray areas create enormous risk. OK, we have two more questions. Um, as a freight forwarder, can you fully rely on your customers doing their due diligence, or are the freight forwarders still liable in an OFAC sense with regards to custom clearance and, and such? Um, I, I, I had that slide. <laughs> I took it out. The, I mean, the, 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 the answer is that the, it, um, particularly on the US, it, is that you can't rely on other people's due diligence entirely. Um, and there certainly have been a number of um, where there's a direct U.S. nexus, all the major uh, third-party logistics providers have been tagged for, for sanctions violations or export control violations. In some cases, it's because their their systems had flaws and they weren't properly screening. Um, so I, I I know you. I had the slide the other way around, which is is can can you the 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 shipper rely on your your freight forwarder and the answer is no because the freight forwarder doesn't know all the things that you know but but i think on the other hand the freight forwarder needs to be doing some screening um you know a reasonable amount of screening themselves great and the last question is is there any possibility of pni clubs being sanctioned if one of the members is violating is violated one of the sanction risks for iran you know that is a really that, that you would have to look at the facts i mean my and, and here there's been a change right in, in that if you had asked me two or three years ago i would have said the only entities that ever end, end up on the sdn list for secondary sanctions are those that have engaged in repeated and egregious you know significant transactions and the the likelihood that and, and i still think it's probably the case the likelihood that the u.s government would sanction a major pni club um, without first talking, you know, trying to cause that that PNI club to take action, or even talking to the government um, before imposing uh, sanctions. But I, I do still think, you know, that it, it doesn't. Add up, you know, things have been a little more mercurial in the last two years, and if, and and so I think there is at least a, a cognizable risk out there. All right. Well, thank you so much. That's all we have time for. Um, Thanks again, Jonathan, for this really informative presentation. Uh, this webinar will be posted on our site later today or tomorrow, so keep an eye out for it. We'll probably fire out an email on Monday with a link to the replay as well for those that attended. Um, we will keep you all updated on next week's webinar, which is developing to be very exciting. But for now, this is John Chair from Marine Money signing out, saying stay healthy and good fortune. <laughs>